back to the sixth lecture in module 3 on finite difference method. In this lecture, we would focus on implementation of boundary conditions and finite difference algebraic system. So, let us have a recap of what we did in the previous lecture. We discussed approximation of second order derivative in a scalar transport equation. We discussed multidimensional formulae and approximation of mixed derivatives. In this lecture, we would focus on how do we implement boundary conditions, particularly the derivative boundary conditions. And we will have a look at the system of algebraic equation, which we obtain from finite difference discretization. So, this is the outline of this lecture. We will first have a look at implementation of boundary conditions. We will derive a required higher order formulae for derivative boundary conditions. And then we will have a look at differential algebraic system, or rather finite difference system, which we get. We will look at nodal discrete algebraic equations. And uh, we will discuss in bit detail that what we call computational molecule or computational stencil in finite differences on a structured grid. And then we will briefly discuss indexing and storage aspects for discrete algebraic system, which we get from finite difference discretization. So, now let us take the first topic, implementation of boundary conditions. Now, we have our partial differential equation and its numerical solution using finite difference requires two things. First is finite difference approximation of partial differential equation at every interior grid point. So, what we will do? We will replace all the derivatives which appear in our partial differential equation with their corresponding finite difference approximations. And this would convert our partial differential equation into an algebraic equation at a given interior grid point. But that is not sufficient enough. We have to impose the boundary conditions, which represent the constraints required to obtain a unique solution of a given continuum problem. Now, we can have two types of boundary conditions. The first one is what we call Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now, Dirichlet basis, uh, they are basically specified values of the unknown variable. Now, these can be incorporated directly. We do not have to do any discretization or any difference approximation at those boundary nodes. But there are boundary nodes where we will have boundary conditions which involve gradient of a variable. It could be in terms of what we call a Neumann boundary condition, where the derivative, first order derivative or what we call flux is specified. We could have a mixture of flux plus uh, so, the derivative plus some uh, multiple of the variable itself, what we call Robin boundary condition. So, for such boundary conditions which involve gradient of a variable, we would use one sided difference formula. To give you just an example, let us have a simple one dimensional problem where boundary node 1 refers to our leftmost node. And suppose derivative of the variable or a function f is specified there. Now, if the derivative is specified, that has to be discretized or approximated using a difference approximation. So, the simplest choice could be the use of forward difference scheme, because we have got now the grid points only to the right of the boundary node 1. Okay. So, we get a very simple difference approximation del f by del x at node 1 is equal to f 2 minus f 1 divided by x 2 minus x 1. Let us have a clearer look at it on our board. So, let us choose or let us draw our simple one dimensional grid with different node points. Let our nodes be numbered from 1 2, 3 and so on. And the last node, let us call it as capital N. 
Now, if the derivative boundary condition is specified here, that is del f by del x at point 1 as some known value, let us call it a 1, it ends the bound similar boundary condition might be specified at node n. Suppose, we say that del f by del x at node point n, that is given by a number a subscript n. Now, if both of these derivatives would require their own finite difference approximation. implementation of derivative boundary conditions so at node 1 there's no node to the left of 1 so use of central difference approximation is ruled out so all that we have got we can do we have got to use one sided difference formula, one sided difference formula involving function values. values at point 1 and other interior nodes. Okay, the simplest option is of course, we use a forward difference scheme. simplest option is 2 point forward difference scheme, which we just saw in our slide. That is to say, this del f over del x at 1, this can be approximated as a difference of f 2 minus f 1 divided by x 2 minus x 1. Okay. Now, if we want to go to the left, so right extreme at node n, what are choices available? We have to look at the node n minus 1, n minus 2 and so on. We have got to use only values available at these nodes. Okay. So, here we have got to use this one sided backward difference formula or backward difference scheme. So, once again the simplest choice is 2 point BDS the simply tells us that del f over del x at the rightmost grid point n this can be approximated in terms of that f n minus f of n minus 1 divided by x n minus x of n minus 1. Now, remember both of these formulae which we have just uh, noted down here, this 2 point f d s at 
the left boundary point 1 or the one at the BDS formula at the rightmost point. In both the cases, our truncation error, this is of order delta x. So, that is the accuracy of the approximation is first order. Suppose you want to have better accuracy, then what do we do? We have to involve more number of grid points. So, implementation of derivative basis Now, let us say we want higher order approximation. Once again, one thing is clear that we have got to use the values at only one point. So, we need one sided difference approximation. or one sided formula. So, let us redraw our previous diagram once again and let us focus on the left most boundary grid point which we have called 1, 1, 2 and 3 and so on. Now, suppose you want to derive or you want uh, higher order formula, which would involve values at at least one more interior point 1, 2 and 3. So, one of the easiest way to do would be try polynomial fitting. Polynomial interpolation for f. So, let us write down f x as a 0 plus a 1 times x minus x 1 plus a 2 times x minus x 1 squared. So, we have taken a quadratic polynomial, which should hopefully give us a second order difference approximation. Now, fit this interpolation at the grid points 1 and 2, this interpolation to function values at grid points 1, 2 and 3. So, if you do that, we will get f 1 is equal to a 0. So, if we straight we got the value of a 0. At point 2, it will give us f 2 is equal to a 0 plus a 1 times x 2 minus x 1 plus a 2 times x 3 minus x 1. So, let us number these equations which I have written. Let us call our interpolation as equation 1, the fit at point 1 as equation 2, fit at point 2 as equation 3 and fit at point 3 f 3 is equal to a 0 plus a 1 times x 3 minus x 1 plus a 2 times x 3 minus x 1 squared. Let us call this equation 4. 
Now, A0 is already known from equation 1, A0 is equal to F1. So, now we have to solve for A1 and A2. We are primarily interested in A1 because that is what will give us the derivative value at point 1. So, let us use equation 3 and 4 to eliminate A2. Okay. So, for this elimination, all that we need to do is multiply the coefficient, cross multiply the coefficient of A2 in, in these two equations with each other. So, let us write equation 3 into x 3 minus x 1 whole square. So, this will give us x 3 minus x 1 square times f 2 is equal to x 3 minus x 1 square times f 1. We have substituted for a 0 as f 1 plus a 1 times x 2 minus x 1 into x 3 minus x 1 squared plus a 2 times x 2 minus x 1 squared into x 3 minus x 1 squared. Let us call this as equation 5. Similarly, this let us multiply equation 4 by x 2 minus x 1 square. So, this will give us x 2 minus x 1 square times f 3 is equal to x 2 minus x 1 square times f 1 plus a 1 times x 3 minus x 1 into x 2 minus x 1 square plus a 2 times x 3 minus x 1 square x 2 minus x 1 square. Let us call this equation as 6. So, now let us subtract 6 from 5. So, subtract 6 from 5 and that will eliminate our a 2. So, we'd, we would be left with x 3 minus x 1 square times f 2 minus x 2 minus x 1 square times f 3 is equal to x 3 minus x 1 square minus x 2 minus x 1 square times f 1 plus a 1 times x 2 minus x 1 into x 3 minus x 1 squared minus x 3 minus x 1 into x 2 minus x 1 squared. Let us rearrange the terms and that gives us the value of the derivative at point 1, del f by del x at point 1 which is equal to a 1 and this gives us x 3 minus x 1 square times f 2 minus x 2 minus x 1 square times f 3 plus x 2 minus x 1 square minus x 3 minus x 1 square times f 1 divided by x 2 minus x 1 x 3 minus x 1 within brackets 
x 3 minus x 2. So, now we have got a formula and we have already seen from general results that this should hopefully be more accurate. So, its accuracy should be closer to second order. Similar formula you can obtain for point n. So, that I would put as an exercise, obtain a three point approximation. point, let us call it at point n, it will be a backward difference. So, three point backward difference approximation at boundary point or boundary grid point capital N using polynomial fitting. The equation can be considerably simplified for a uniform grid spacing. Okay, this is just a recap of the formula which I have just derived. And please note that this one sided difference formula, they are also useful apart from the implementation of boundary condition. They can be used in post processing. For instance, we want to evaluate the heat flux or let us say stresses at or strain rates at the boundary points. Now, suppose we have not done our discretization we have implemented our boundary conditions. Now, let us see, let us collect our finite difference system. So, finite difference approximation of derivatives in a partial differential equation leads to an algebraic equation at each node in terms of variable values at the node and its neighboring values. So, we can write this equation by noting its form. So, this equation would be linear if a partial differential equation were linear that is all its coefficients of derivatives were either fixed numbers and this equation would be a non-linear equation if a partial differential equation were non-linear. Now, even if the equation were non-linear, we would write it in a linearized form because that is what we would use in the numerical solution of our discrete algebraic system. So, now let us write that linearized form. If our equation were linear, it, the, the form would be as such. Otherwise, we will call it a quasi linear equation. So, this quasi linear equation obtained from finite difference discretization of a PDE for let us say a generic scalar, our at phi could be any velocity component, it could be temperature, or if you are solving for pressure Poisson equation, it could be pressure. So, let us let us call it a generic scalar phi at grid point P or any specific grid point can be represented as A P into phi P plus summation over L A L phi L is equal to Q P. Now, here is P which have used P represents the node at which our partial differential equation has been approximated that is the, it represents the grid point at which the P D E all the derivatives in P D have been replaced by the corresponding finite difference approximations and L denotes the neighboring nodes which are involved in finite difference approximation of derivative. In Q P we have collected all the terms which are not in terms of phi. These might be result of body forces or source terms and so on. So, this is a general linearized system or discrete system, which we would obtain for each grid point in our computational domain. Now, note that uh, this coefficient a p and a l, they are functions of grid sizes, the delta x, delta y and delta z and material properties. Okay. Now, in this node p and its neighboring nodes, they form so called computational molecule or stencil. Okay. Now, in finite difference method what we do? We normally employ a structured grid that is to say at each point the grid locally rep represents 
an orthogonal grid system. So, now in this case, we use what we call compass notation, okay, that is a node p i j, node p whose indices are given by i j, it is node i plus oneth, that is a node which is towards to the right of it, we will denote by its turn node or its turn neighbor, node i comma j minus 1 is denoted by southern neighbor and so on. Okay. And the computational molecule that would depend on the choice of finite difference approximation of the derivative. Let us have a bit more look, a detailed look at this computational molecule. So, let us get back to a board. or we also call it a stencil. So, if you are dealing with one dimensional problems, of course, we will have a grid along a line. My next direction is called this ith node, then i plus 1, i plus 2, i minus 1, and i minus 2. The central node, which is focus of our attention, this denote by capital P, that is the present node, P represents the present grid point or node. Okay, the one which is to the right of it, we will say that that corresponds to the eastern node, or we will call it as eastern neighbor i plus 2, that is to the east of our eastern neighbor. So, we will write it as E, E, i minus 1, it is to the left and we will use the symbol w to denote its western neighbor. Node i minus 2, that would be called west of west, so w, w. So, this is our notation or compass notation for the grid point. Now, the stencil would depend on the choice of difference approximation. So, suppose if you use three point CDS, So, our computational stencil would do consist of three nodes, i, i plus 1 and i minus 1. Let us use slightly bigger circles to clearly denote the part of a stencil. So, stencil would consist of node p, e and w. If we use five point series, then in that case the stencil would be broader. So, this P, this I, I plus one, I plus two, I minus one i minus 2, let us put bigger circles to denote distance e, 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 w, w, w. So, our choice of distance will also tell us when we look next at our algebraic system of equations as to how many diagonals, non-zero diagonals are present in our system of equations. So, if you have got a three point series, it will lead to what we call a tri-diagonal matrix. If you are dealing with five point series in one dimensions, we will get a pentadiagonal matrix. Now, let us take this two dimensional case.
So, for two dimensional problems, we will have x as well as y grid lines. So, let us draw this x line and this is y line. The intersection point that would be our grid point i j. The grid point to the right of it, that is what we will call as eastern neighbor and its index would be i plus 1 comma j. The node i minus 1 comma j that would be denoted as western neighbor. Node towards the upper side, following our compass notation, this becomes what we call northern node. So, this i j plus 1 will use the symbol n to denote it. Similarly, this node i j minus 1 will use symbol s and we will call it a southern node. So, if you have got a 5 point series for second order derivatives, in our or other for our second order PDE. Our resistance will consist of these points P, E, W, N and S. In three dimensions, we have to add or we would use symbols capital T to denote the top side that is up positive z side and symbol B to denote the negative uh, neighbor on towards the negative z side of what we call the bottom neighbor. So, this is schematic representation in 3 D 7 point molecule. So, grid point P represented by I, J, K. Suppose this for x direction, y direction and the vertical side we have got our z direction. So, towards top that node I, J, K plus 1 we represent it by symbol capital T. Similarly, the one towards negative z axis that neighbor is i comma j comma k minus 1, this is denoted by symbol capital B, it is called bottom neighbor, top neighbor and bottom neighbor. Other two sides the same thing, we have brought this turn neighbor along positive x axis. i plus 1 j comma k, western neighbor towards the negative x axis i minus 1 j comma k. Towards positive y side, we have got what we call <coughs> the northern neighbor n, its indices would be i j plus 1 k and Similarly, towards negative y side, that is our southern neighbor, which will have the index i j minus 1. So, this is a popular compass notation, which we use in finite differences. This notation would also be used when we are dealing with the structured grids in finite volume. So, we will come back to this notation once again, when we start off with finite volume methods in later modules. Okay. So, now we have seen that look at each grid node, we get 
a, a, a simple algebraic equation which we can always write in a linearized form. Similarly, at boundary nodes, if there are derivatives present, we can use a finite difference approximation. Once again, we can get an equation, algebraic equation for our boundary nodes. For the boundary nodes where the function itself is specified, we get a very simple equation, algebraic equation. So, if we collect all those discrete algebraic equations at all the nodes, that is our internal nodes as well as our external nodes, all these else. So, we get a sim, uh, system capital A into phi is equal to Q, where this A is called the coefficient matrix or system matrix. Capital phi, it is a vector of unknown nodal values at all the grid points. And in this vector capital Q, the bold Q, we have collected all the terms on the right hand side. That is Q represents the vector of known terms or what we call the right hand side terms. So, those are contained in Q. Now, in the case of finite difference and same would be the case in finite volume and finite element techniques, this discrete system matrix A has got some special properties. So, what are the properties of system matrix A which are obvious? The first obvious property is matrix A is always sparse. There are non-zero entries only on few places in the matrix. And as far as the structure of this matrix is concerned, it depends on the ordering of variables in the vector phi. Okay. And the most popular ordering scheme which were used earlier was what we call lexicographic ordering, in which variables are usually ordered starting from a corner and traversing line after line in a regular manner. So, the only requirement is let us start from one corner node, then follow one line, then next line parallel to it, next line parallel to it and so on, go to the next plane in a 3D case to generate our indices. Okay. For instance, if we start the ordering the variable from a corner, this traversal which we call our lexicographic ordering, it results in a polydiagonal structure for matrix A. That is, there would be only a set of specific diagonals which are non-zero, remaining all the entries of matrix A are zero. Now, we can have different regular orderings. So, this lexicographic ordering is not unique as it depends on the order of line traversal in different directions, x, y and z directions, which way we have followed. That is up to us. So, we can have different types of lexicographic ordering. Now, please note that we need to worry about this lexicographic ordering only if one plans to use a direct solver. That is, we have assembled a matrix A, which is square matrix multiplied by vector phi is equal to Q and we want to use a standard a direct linear solver. Only in that case, we, we need to store this full two dimensional matrix. Most of the time, in fact, in CFD, we do not do it. Now, our matrix A is sparse. That is what we have seen. That is the basic property. And it has got a polydiagonal structure for structured grids. In case of our differences, we, have all, we always use structured grid. So, A would have a polydiagonal structure. So, now we have got two options. One option is we store full two dimensional grid and thereby we will have many zeros. So, we are just storing useless zero numbers which are of no use. We won't, they do not contribute to a solution process in any way. So, what we can instead do is we can store these diagonals separately. So, it is preferable to store this matrix as a set of one dimensional arrays, one one dimensional array for each diagonal. So, that would be a much better choice. Now, to understand this statement, let us take a typical example. Suppose we are working with a 2D problem, 2D elliptic problem. And for discretization, suppose we have chosen a rectangular grid. Okay. 
that's what we would use in finite difference method we'll choose a rectangular cartesian grid just for the sake of argument suppose the number of points grid points which you have used in x direction those are 100 which is fairly common in fact we might be using a much larger number similarly let's say that in y direction we have chosen the total number of grid lines is again 100 so if we store all the entries we now we will have 100 total number of grid points total number of grid points that would be 100 cross 100 that is we are we have got 10 to the power 4 grid points in our computational domain now if you store full matrix a if we store a 2d matrix of order n how many entries we require we require n square entries and now here we have got our n is 10 to the power of 4 so if you store all the entries in our finite difference matrix so thus the storage requirement the storage requirement for full matrix is proportional to n square in this particular example it is proportional to 10 to the power 8 but suppose we have used 5 point series so with 5 point series scheme or matrix A will have only non-zero entries along 5 diagonals so in this case what will be storage requirement so if we store only these five diagonals our storage requirement or what this also linked to our memory requirement so storage requirement this is proportional to five times n that is in our case n was equal to 10 to the power 4 so it's just 5 into 10 to the power now you can say if the proportionality constant we take here as a, that for each real variable we require let us say k bytes so the total memory required in the first case for the full storage this would be 10 to the power 8 bytes and the second case first case let us call it capital M1 and the second case total memory required would be M2 that will be 5k into 10 to the power four bytes so if you take the ratio of the two m2 by m1 that is 5k into 10 to the power 4 divided by k 
k into 10 to the power 8, we get 5 into 10 to the power minus 4 or which we can say approximately 10 to the power minus 3. So, our storage requirement if we follow or if we make use of the sparsity pattern, those are 1000 smaller than the full matrix storage. And that is what we would in no normal programming, that is what we do. Whenever we write our CFD programs, we never ever store full two dimensional matrix while using finite differences, we will only store these non zero entries or non -diag zero diagonals. Okay. So, that is why we say it is preferable because we are going to save lots and lots of memory if we store these diagonals as one dimensional arrays. Eight other option in modern programming languages is to use a record or a struct type for the matrix. Now, which one you choose whether we choose a set of arrays, we can name them as A, P, A and, and so on or we use a record as struct type, this final choice would depend on the overall data structure chosen for the computer implementation and the language which we have chosen for implementation. For today, we just stop here and uh, we would take up the struct or record type examples in our application part. So, in the next lecture, we will take up one or two problems and we would use finite difference approximation to come up with the final discrete system. We will also try and solve one problem in full and then we will have a look at an outline of a computer program based on C language in the next one or two lectures.